Welcome back, scholars. Tonight we're talking about Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative, one of the most famous narratives of um, of uh, the white person in, in, in their, her experiences in Indian captivity. The amazing thing about this not this narrative, she had to tell it mostly from memory. Clearly, she didn't have time or the or the wherewithal to write it down while she was going through it. Um, it's a fascinating tale, and one of the things that makes it so so um, compelling is not only the detail, but the even-handedness of the narrator. Uh, one of the foundations of America is religion, to a greater or lesser sense, uh, religious freedom, and that is readily evident here in the captivity narrative by Mary Rowlandson. The theme that keeps coming up again and again is how thankful she is to God for his blessings and for him looking after her. In fact, the her, her abduction seems to even bolster her faith. She talks about at one point how she had thought of the the number of Sabbaths that she had neglected. In, in this case, it's Sunday instead of, instead of Saturday. But uh, and it, she seems to redouble her faith. Um, to double well to you know, embrace it and draw more closely to God in spite of her circumstances. The narrative begins with a very graphic depiction of the Indian attack on the settlement. And when I googled the image of Mary Rowlandson's captivity, this is what I, I came up with. Um, I don't think I don't think this is Mary Rowlandson Rowlandson with the the musket here. If if it is, they took a great deal of creative license here because. Uh, nothing in the nothing in the narrative has uh, any any depiction of her you know, exchanging fire with them. Um, but it's the yeah the narrative and the um, the scene where the abduction first takes place is incredibly brutal in graphics. He said at one point it sent there were uh, the house was set fire to and they had flankers there were, there were guys on either side shooting at the attackers, and they were able to put out the initial conflagration, but the um, they quickly set it on fire again, this time it took. And so they're getting ready to leave the house, and just as they're about to run out, um, <coughs> enough uh, uh, musket balls at this point sound, hit the uh, side of the building, and it sounds like, it sounds like um, rocks being thrown against it. Yeah. And in this First, uh, in the uh, initial assault, she loses her nephew, who she's carrying, and she's, he's shot through the hand and through the stomach and expires. And her sister is killed, and the bullet actually that kills her nephew goes into him, and her brother-in-law is killed as well. It's incredibly um, tragic and heart-wrenching. Most people would would likely not survive in this case. You know, just the, the, the grief and the depression alone would end them, but somehow Mary Rollinson brought her up. In the midst of this, she, um, in the midst of the chaos, she is told if she comes quietly, she won't be harmed. Uh, at the conclusion of the first encounter, she praises God. Yes. She praises God for sparing her life, for delivering her from, um, from, from the violence and the chaos that claimed everyone else. Now, her sister stood at the doorway and Knowing, hearing that her child was killed <clears throat> and that Mary was wounded, she said, I would, uh, I would rather die too. I'd rather that God take me to be with them. And at that point, she is shot and, and is killed. But, the, um, but yes, the, uh, her reaction to, to what she's been through is to thank God for being with her. In fact, um, the remarkable thing is that her faith seems only to be increased by her. Ordeal. At one point, she is given a Bible by an Indian on a raiding party. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, "Look, I, I have this, and it was in my basket. Could you use it?" Uh, and he said, "Yes, of course, I can use it." And one of, the, and interestingly enough, one of the things they tell you, and if you're being uh, the advice I read once on on a, a web source, if you're being held hostage for a while, one of the things they tell you, they suggest you do is ask for a Bible. It tends to humanize you with your captors, and it gives you something to read to pass the time. You know, boredom is one of the biggest um, 
detriments to someone who is being held captive for a lengthy period of time. Um, but so uh, she's wounded, and her daughter is too. And her she's, uh, the her daughter is riding on a horse with one of the Indians, and keeps saying, "I think I'm going to die." And so Mary Rollinson winds up carrying her daughter as long as she does, as she can until she they both fall from exhaustion, and so then they are uh, placed on a horse and. Her daughter rides on her lap, and and then at one point the um, when they're going downhill, they go wind up tumbling over the horse's head because there's no she puts in furniture, I think. There's, there's no saddle, and of course the Indians laugh at her, and then she you know chides them for their brutality, at least in her narrative. So <clears throat> there's a mixture of both. Uh, well, it, eventually her daughter dies, and. When it's happening, they send her to another wigwam, uh, I guess because of taboos, superstitions about a dead body. And she says, you know, I never thought, never wanted to be close to a dead body, but I laid next to my daughter for throughout the night for the longest time. And at one point she's called away, and so the Native Americans go, and they, they bury her daughter for her. So there is a mixture of cruelty and honor here, cruelty and respect. Uh, amongst her captors here. In fact, there are numerous instances of this throughout the narrative. Um, she becomes a, well, she is, um, she makes good with her captors because she can sew. And they have her make uh, papoose, they make, uh, make gloves, stockings, that sort of thing. And so she puts herself to good work, to good use for the tribe, um, repurposing the clothes of pilgrims, essentially. In one case, she uses a a um, pillowcase to make a shirt for a papoose. So, what should we take away from this? Is what we should take away is how much uh, the Native Americans here defy categorization. The early pilgrims in the um, narrative by uh, William Bradford are referred to as savages in some cases. In other cases, they make they make a treaty with them. They um, they have a, a fine relationship where they they have a sort of mutual protection for us. Um, they're neither completely savage nor are they completely civilized in the way that we understand civilization. And maybe that's the point. Well, perhaps what is going on here is they were acting within the rules and confines of their society, the the strictures of their society, and it was the pilgrims who were the uncivilized. Ones. Notice there is a, a certain economy here. There's a there's money to be made from ransoming pilgrims and uh, ransoming captives back, and um, there is a, a sort of trade in there. In fact, at one point she encounters um, a relative of hers who had, I think, a daughter who had been traded for a gun, but you know because she because it caused her such emotional um, such an emotional outburst, they kept them apart. <clears throat> Mary Rollinson seems to um, integrate fairly well into the tribe, though. Uh, she is a captive, but yet she is looked after and, and um, does the best she can to, to make the best of her situation. And it's mutually beneficial for both. There are also what, what you refer to as praying Indians, Indians who are Christians. One well, I mean, there's Peter and Tom who help negotiate on her behalf. Um, at one point in the narrative, her tone is almost sympathetic toward her captors. Uh, when she was talking about when the English army was coming and, uh, and they were pursuing to the point where the tribes were starting to you know, hungry and starving and survive. Uh, you could said you could almost track them from uh, what they had moored in the ground looking for, for nuts and berries and things. What makes the native, uh, the narrative rather so important is the detail and the largely unbiased nature of the work. There's a little bit of bias, of course, as, there, as you would expect, um, because they weren't always kind to her. Many of the squaws were, 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 were cruel and vicious to her. But she speaks almost kindly of, of her captives in many places, and she remains objective about her situation. Yes. And particularly of, of note is how much um, how much she 
quotes the scripture and how much he praises God. And so, you know, this is the, um, this is the society that the pilgrims came to establish. And uh, a common belief, a common faith, perhaps, um, either secular or religious, is, is key to the founding of a society, and particularly the founding of America. Fascinating narrative. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. It's hard to apply literary theory to something like this because it's it's essentially a biography. It's a, a narrative of personal expense, uh, experience, rather. Um, of course, being written from memory, there's mem uh, most definitely some embellishments, some things that were, um, you know, not as they actually occurred because that's how memory works. But it's true enough to the narrator. All right, so that is the narrative, the captivity narrative of Mary Rowlandson. Hope you enjoyed it. It's a fascinating story. It tells us a lot about America, too, and, and our beginnings. Yes. Um, how we are as a society and how much, how much a part religious um, faith played in the, in the uh, establishment of our country. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.